to people. Uh, today we're going to have a look at a tutorial in creating a parallax effect similar to one that you can see here using Adobe Photoshop and then taking it into After Effects. So this is going to be close to actually what our end product is going to look like and we're going to run through this as an entire process. Cool. All right, so uh, first of all, I'm going to have a look at an image here. Now, this image here I've managed to get from Adobe Stock and import into Photoshop. So obviously, when you are looking for images to find uh, for this kind of exercise, you don't have good quality images of a reasonable resolution. And the simple reason for that is Photoshop really does like having a little bit more detail to be able to use its automated uh, masking and deep etching tools, such as the quick selection tool or subject selection tool. Over here, this image here is demonstrating what we're kind of looking for in our images in order to break it apart into different sections for importing into After Effects to animate. So here I've broken this down into a foreground area, which is this little purple area here, midground area, and this is including our character here as well, in this case, and our background, and then a sky layer. So it really depends on your image, but what you kind of want to think of is breaking into core separate areas as far as distance and then also if you are going to animate any of these sections like this character for example you may actually want to have those separately so it really depends on the scenario but we're going to run through the entire process so let's jump into it i'm actually going to start off by setting up a new a new document so i'm going to go file new and i'm in photoshop beta at the moment but it should be pretty much the same and in this case i'm going to build for film and video so we do have a bunch of presets that we can choose from here and i recommend um, either building in your desired preset or potentially slightly larger so i have in the in the past mentioned using uh, ultra high d hd tv um, 4k and this will hopefully be about the same aspect ratio 16 by 9 aspect ratio as HDTV 1080p but if you do want to make the project a little bit lighter for After Effects if you're not running on a really high performance machine you may want to actually build it in HDTV 1080p but again this really does depend on your project parameters whether you need something detailed or not but I'm going to go ahead and go Ultra ID HDTV 4k 1260p and hit create Cool. Now uh, we're going to start off here. We're going to have some guidelines, and I'm going to get rid of those. I'm going to go to View Guides, and I'm going to go uh, Clear Guides right over there. I don't need to see those. Those are our screen safe and title safe guides. And then what I'm going to do is import my image. Now I've already uh, downloaded my image, so this is somewhere over here. There we go. So that one there no this one here so i'm looking for something with uh, sort of world war one world war two um example this one's pretty good these are you know some, a couple of good examples of parallax images and i'm simply going to drag this into photoshop now if it is a fairly low a small size image it will come in smaller than the actual document um, however if it is a larger document so let's see if we can find see how big this one is and i'm going to drag and drop it in there uh, it's about the same sort of size so either way is going to work let's jump in grab this one as we did and i'm going to scale this a little bit closer to our document so when you first drag and drop an image into photoshop you will have an option of scaling it before you place it and you can either grab the corners here and drag it out and try not to stretch your image um, if it is, just go up to the top here, it says W and H, and just make sure that little link is connected so that you're not accidentally distorting your image. I'm just going to drag that out to try and fit the proportions of my document. That being done, hit OK, and that is going to give us um, our image in relation to the size of our final output into After Effects. So the next thing I'm going to do is, like I've shown in the example here, is try to break down the areas. So foreground, midground, background. Each image is going to have its own challenges, but let's see if we can figure some of these out. So I'm going to start off by duplicating this image. Um, the background we probably don't need, so if you do want to delete that, that's fine. But I'm going to duplicate this, and a quick way of duplicating is to drag that down to the plus icon in your layers panel. 
and other way of duplicating is to right click and go to duplicate layer right there. It will ask you to name it, but that's fine anyway. We're going to rename. And essentially, I'm going to create a new layer for each main area. So you may want to do this on the fly. Uh, I like to work um, non destructively, which means basically I'm going to use masks and stuff like that so I can always fix them up later. All right, so let's start going around this sort of in the main chunky areas. So one of the big areas in here is I want to get this foreground area and my character selected. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my W tools. Now, the big one for us at the moment, which has worked really well in most cases, the object selection tool. And if you hover over, it will actually do a reasonable job of selecting particular objects. So you can see as I hover over this, it's going, okay, there's some stuff over here. Now it's not perfect, so we may need to do this stuff manually, but I can simply either click in there and it will select. And if I want to select more of an area, I can hold down shift and select more of an area and so on and so forth. So I'm selecting all those. Now I'm going to press uh, Command or Control D to deselect. And I've also got this set on either rectangle or lasso. And simply what that means is I can actually drag over a subject like that and give it a moment and see if it managed to do a reasonable cutout of that. And this one actually has it's done a pretty good job of that. Um, now I could separate that character into its own layer at the moment, uh, which I might do. I might do something different than I had before. And what I'm going to do is hit the mask button, the lower part of your layer panel. So there's the button there. And as you can see, it's going to mask out my character. Now the cool thing with this is the mask is completely editable. So if you do need to, you know, erase or add sections to this, you can either go into mask mode by double clicking on the mask or um, going into select the mask and this will enter into a, a mask mode, um, which is quite a complex sort of thing, but we may have a look at that a bit later. Or you can actually just use your brush tool to either paint in black, which is going to erase, or white, which is going to rebuild your image, like so. Anyway, that being aside, once you've separated an area, you may wish to rename it. I'm going to call this one Dude. And then I'm going to go back to my background area. So now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to start re-selecting multiple areas. So I'm going to go back, duplicate my background layer. I'm going to hide the one below it. So I'm just trying to work on one layer at a time. I'm going to go back to my W tool and make sure I'm on the object selection tool. And this time I'm going to switch to lasso, lasso, lasso. And something weird happened just then. So I'm going to hit Command D. And essentially, I'm just going to drag that lasso around, roughly around the area that I want to get and see how it handles it. And I think it's done a reasonable job there. Um, remember, if you do need to add to an area, you can also go to L, uh, sorry, uh, L for lasso tool. And you can select either the poly or the freeform lasso tool and hold down shift to add or alt. Alt on um, Alt Option key to subtract areas. So you can actually go through this manually. For this, I do usually recommend the Poly Lasso tool because it just adds a little bit of control. Even though if you are just using it uh, incrementally, it's a click point by point thing, and it kind of stops you from accidentally. Um, if you take your finger off the mouse, it's not going to instantly close the shape. So you can double click close. So that's good. I'm going to. Deselect that. I know I've just selected it, but let's try a different tool here. And this is the quick selection tool. And quick selection tool basically works by allowing you to click and then drag through an area and start from the middle of the area you want and then push it out towards the boundaries. And then eventually it kind of kind of jump probably. So you can see how this is working fairly well. Now if you want to remove an area, once again the alt option key is your friend and it You'll see the little icon turns to a negative inside that circle. And I can click and drag through and sort that out. Easy peasy. To add again, uh, with this one, you don't necessarily have to hold down shift because if you have a look at the top here, this little plus icon is added. 
and I can go through and just click, click drag. So this one works pretty well as well in most cases. Now you will run occasionally into situations where this will not work as amazingly as you like it. Be willing to push it forwards and backwards with Alt, Option, or Shift, whatever's needed to get the area that you need. If all else fails, if absolutely nothing else will work, then do rely a little bit on uh, potentially your lasso tools because they are going to be do exactly what you expect them to do. All right, so now I've got that area selected. I'm going to go down and hit my mask key and have a look at that. Now I do have a little, a few little weird um, extra bits that have been missed from that. That does happen on occasions. My little clue for doing dealing with this directly is create a new layer, blank layer here. Go to your paint bucket tool. Now the shortcut for paint bucket tool is G. You may need to switch it from gradient to paint bucket. And let's select a contrasting color. Now, usually I'll go for something like a bright red, and I'm just going to dump that in, just create a full red layer, and drag that below. And that's just going to help me see any areas that need a bit of fixing up on my mask. Click in the mask there, and B for brush, select black in this case, because I want to erase. And I'm just going to paint over those like so. Awesome. Now, at this point, I do want to mention the mask mode. So over here, we've got our layer. It has a mask attached. And if you typically double click in that mask or go to right click in there and go to selected mask, it will enter you into a thing called mask mode. Now, this can be a little bit tricky the first time you, you handle this, but essentially what we're looking at is we want to have a look is the view options of this. And we've got one called onion skinning, which is going to allow you to see the rest of the player um, layers below. And you can change the transparency on that. And there's a few others like overlay. Oddly enough, because I've chosen red, it's actually going to have red applied to it, but you can actually change that uh, to a different color if need be. And then we just change the opacity according to how much we want to see of what's hidden and what isn't. So there's a few things that might be worth looking at here. There's a button here called Refine Hair. Now, I know we don't have any hair on this, but if there's edges of something that has hair in it or potentially leaves and stuff, this can be really good. But if that doesn't work, another option is to try the Refine Edge Brush. Now, you may need to increase the brush size here. You can use your square brackets on your keyboard, or you can go to the brush size up here. And essentially what you're going to do is, I'm going to zoom in for this one, is run over the edge of the object and it may or may not do a good job of refining the edge. Now, this is these are pretty hard edges, so I, I don't really need it to do too much for that. But, you know, let's see what else we've got in here. So over here on the right, we've got an option for feathering. So if you click on that, you can might be able to see that it's going to feather the edges. Um, if that's going to help soften if there's any hard edges on there. And you've also got an option of shifting the edge in and out. So there is a little, you know, there's a few little things to play around with this and it's going to give you a nice neat image and, you know, make it look a bit more organic than if it's just a straight cut outline. So I'm going to hit OK, step out of mask mode, and now I've got my character and I've also got the layer below. And essentially we're just going to go through and repeat those steps. So I'm going to keep this one fairly simple for uh, as far as how many layers I'm going to do for this one. But I'm going to turn these layers off and I'm just going to focus in on the next area, which is the area behind. So once again, I'm going to duplicate. Um, it's probably a good idea to actually make sure you rename your areas. So I'm going to call this one FG, simply for foreground. So that is this area here. Um, there is this sort of um, apparatus in the front here that you could potentially separate as well. I did that for the demo one, but you know, that's up to you. So I'm going to call this foreground, dude, I'm actually going to place behind the foreground. Um, and we've got a couple of issues with these boots, but we'll sort that out in a moment. And then I'm going to clear out the dude and the background because essentially what's going to happen is I'm going to have the foreground and background here. And if I parallax this, you know, faking this in Photoshop, we're going to have, still have those two existing in that background. So we need to kind of fix that up uh, just a little bit. So I'll turn those off. 
And here's a really interesting way of approaching this. So I have my, um, my image of my dude. Now I'm gonna do something just to add a little color to this so you can see the difference. I'm gonna to go to FX and color overlay. Now you definitely don't need to do this, but I'm just adding a little bit of color to this so we can see that this is a separate layer. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna reselect the contents of that layer. Now a quick way of doing that is um, we have the mask here, which is actually um, hiding the background. So this is the thing I actually want is the mask itself. I'm gonna hit the command key on Mac or control key on PC. And you'll see this little finger icon changes with a little rectangle. And if you click on that, that will select the contents of that layer. So I can have that layer off. It's still gonna allow me to click, hold down command or control on PC and click and select that. So now I'm gonna to go to this layer here, which I wanna actually remove the background from. Now, we can run into a potential problem with this, and one of the big problems with this is that this is currently a smart object. You can tell by this icon here, which means it cannot be directly destroyed. So it may come to a point where you may need to right click on that and rasterize this. So right click, rasterize layer. Um, so I'm actually gonna do that because I do wanna keep everything a little bit neat, not too many layers. So rasterize layer. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna try some of the automated stuff in Photoshop to try and repair the background. Now I happen to know this isn't gonna work really well, but let's go through it anyway. So this area is selected, great. I'm gonna to go to edit and then content aware fill. So content aware fill. And it's gonna open up with a dual screen like this. And you can see it's actually done a reasonable job, this is our outcome screen here, of fixing up the area over here. So there is a bit of a ghost around this, which, you know, that's gonna be okay, but um, you can actually, you know, increase or decrease some of this as well. And I'm gonna show you how to do that um, outside of this area. So I don't, don't think that's, that's an okay response, but there is that weird ghost effect that's happening in there, which I don't really like. So I'm gonna cancel out of there. And now what I'm gonna do with my selection still there, I'm gonna to go to select, modify, and expand. Now, if you do happen to have um, the, the latest Photoshop, you may actually see the little bar that pops up. The option is in here, in there as well, but I'm gonna go back to this one. So that again is select, modify, expand. And I'm gonna, expand this by a reasonable amount. I'm gonna try like 20 pixels to start with and hit okay. That's not too bad. So all I'm doing is expanding out my selections. I'm giving Photoshop a bit more of an opportunity to repair, but with that, but we're staying away from the edges of this a little bit. Um, so let's try that again. So I'm gonna go edit, content aware fill. There it is there, and that just above the middle. And that's looking a little bit better. So if I zoom in, zoom out of that. Zoomed in a bit too harshly there. I'm just gonna cancel and do that again because it did jump a little bit. Uh, so edit content aware fill. Whoops, did the wrong one. Content aware fill. And that's okay, it's not, not great. So you may want to experiment with expanding and moving that out. I'm gonna hit okay. Um, actually, sorry, I'm gonna undo that. So what I did wrong there was go uh, and just press okay. I'm gonna be a little bit more aggressive with this. Um, I'm gonna to go to edit, content aware, fill. And I'm gonna leave the settings as they are, but the only thing I'm gonna change is the output from new layer to current layer. So just that way I'm not making an additional layer and it's gonna jump in and it's just gonna you know, add whatever it needs to that particular layer. I'm gonna hit deselect. Now it's still not amazing, but you know, it's, it's getting there. So the other thing I wanna look at doing is potentially doing some manual fix up on this. So to do this, we've got a few options. One is using the S shortcut S for the clone stamp tool. 
The other one is using the spot healing brush tool or the healing brush tool. So, or potentially the patch tool. So I'm gonna show you how both of these work. I'm gonna start with the stamp tool, S for stamp. And essentially this is a brush. Now I'm gonna use my square brackets in this case just to get a larger brush size. Let's zoom in a bit and have a look at some areas that need fixing up. So one of the glaring areas is this weird rock formation here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stamp, which is basically steel areas from another part here. So currently I've got aligned and set to current layer. So it means it's gonna reference this color and layer. Uh, if you have multiple layers that you're referencing, you can switch this to current and below or all layers, but this one should work fine for me. I'm going to hit the Alt or Option key, and I'm going to bring my tag over an area that I might want to steal from. So I want to get rid of this mess here, so I'm going to click maybe over here. And then as I move my brush, you can probably see it's going to start creating like a little ghost. And it starts copying from that area. Now, you may need to do this multiple times. So... In order to try and stop repetition, I might steal another area from over here, for example, and paint that in, see how that works. Alt, or Option key, and then I'm just gonna keep punching through and fixing that up. So this, we've got a, a, a repeat here as well. So maybe for this one, I might go through and just grab a little area here. Let's paint that through there. Let's steal the area from here. Let's paint that through. And I might fix up some of this dirt and debris that's got some repetition to it. And we can go through and hopefully we can get a relatively cleaned up area. Again, it works like a brush, so be willing to just, you know, punch through, grab some different areas. So that's one way, and that works really, really well. The other way is using the spot healing tool. Now, the spot healing tool is for actually repairing uh, little blemishes and stuff. So this, to give you an example, uh, once again, choose sample layers or not but I'm on the right layer is I can just click over an area and it's going to try and repair it um, according to what Photoshop thinks it is supposed to be so you know, if I go over this little flame here it's going to try and repair that. Now, there's a little bit of more advanced one in here on the healing brush tool so instead of the spot healing tool I'm going healing brush tool and it works on the same principle except in this case it allows you to hit the alt option key to bring up a target and then you can actually use that to paint over an existing area and it's going to try and combine the two. So it's sort of like the stamp tool, except it's gonna give you a bit of a mix of both. So, you know, that's pretty cool as well. And then finally, the patch healing tool, which is really good. So patch healing tool is really good for doing large areas. And what you can do with that is you can select an area that you want to use as a repair area and set that from source to destination. And then you can actually drag over an existing area and it's going to try and combine the two together. You can see how that's kind of working there. So that works really well. You may need to like redo this a few times. If you do it the other way where you set from source, um, it essentially means you can select an area that you want to fix. So let's say I'm going to select this area. I don't want to make it too big because I need to drag it somewhere and then drag it over somewhere and see if you can find something that's going to be a good texture for that and so on and so forth. So this could be a great way of filling this out. Um, but, you know, there's a bunch of different ways that we can do this um, to try and repair um, this one. Um, all right. So... Hopefully you can kind of see what we got, what's going on here. I might just do this a few more times. Let's see if we can find something that's going to be working for this area. Um, so it's mixing and matching all of this sort of stuff. Now, I don't need to get too carried away uh, completely with this. I do want to try and avoid uh, too many repetitions. So I'm looking for things that look like they are repeated in there but I think this is getting close for a demo. All right, so now I've got my, essentially my background layer. So I'm gonna rename this BG from background. Then I've got my dude, I've got this color overlay, and then I've got the foreground over the top. So while we're here, let's have a quick look at repairing the foreground. So the foreground does have his boots right there. So easy enough, I'm gonna grab that foreground layer 
once again, it is a smart object. And essentially what that means is if I grab the stamp tool and I try to stamp in here, it's going to come up saying smart object must be rasterized. So, okay, great. So I'm going to hit rasterize and it loses that little icon there. And then I can go through and use that stamp tool to maybe try and get rid of those boots like so. So there we go. And now I'm going to have him standing behind like so. And and I've got my cleared out background. All right, so next thing I want to do is actually get my sky layer separate. So if I want to have some cloud effects and that sort of thing, um, our sky is quite far away, so it typically does or should be a separate layer. Um, in this case, I've done some repair to the background, so um, you know it's, it's going to be slightly different um, if I compare this to the existing image and this is the repaired image it's going to be slightly different uh, just in general so i'm going to actually duplicate that background layer again like so and select on the one called uh, bg at this moment i'm going to call this sky and i'm going to as you can see i'm turning off the visibility of the previous ones and I can go through and I can try my selection tools. I've got my quick selection. I've got my object selection. Uh, Magic wand tool is not going to be that useful for this kind of thing. And I can try those. But there is another option for skies in particular. To get that, we can actually go to select. And we can also go to... Do, 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 do. Oh, actually, I need to make sure I've got the layer selected. I did not do that. Go to select and sky. And it's going to tick through and... It, actually does a fairly good job of that. Um, and then I'm going to simply hit the mask key. Now, if that doesn't work, then, you know, you can obviously go through and do some repairs and stuff um, yourself for that. But, you know, as required, there are a few little glitches and stuff in there as well. There's some gaps there. So what I might do with that one here is actually right click on the mask and apply it. So it's essentially going to cut out the mask and then I'm just going to go through and either stamp or try to use the healing tool or oh, healing tool just brush through and see how that works it's not working that well so you might have to use the stamp tool and just sort of brush through because it is a sky it's usually quite forgiving just watch those corners and we can just get you know that kind of thing the other way of getting through this is to, um, you know, just when we do take it into After Effects, it's just really blow out the size of the sky or just replace it with another sky if need be. So there's lots we can do in there. And now I might switch over to my Spot Healing Tool, Shortcut J, and then just you know, punch through, just tap a couple of these little specs. So uh, proximity match, a few little options in there. So if we want it to look good. And you can always blur this later, but I'd leave that for now. So I've got a sky layer, awesome. I've got a background layer, and now I've got dude, and I've got the foreground. So I'm going to delete any unnecessary layers at this point. I'm going to delete that one. Um, you may want to keep the background, like the, the reference image. Um, you can have that turned off, but you really want to get down to just a bare minimum of layers. Next thing is to save the sucker out. So you can go File, Save or file save as, whichever is going to work for you. I'm going to go file save as because I've pretty saved this. Give it a name, so I'm going to call it Parallax uh, WW2B01, so version 1. Depending on what you want to call it, I'm going to put mine in documents for me, but find a good place for you to save it and hit OK. Run through. All right, so here's our next step. Our next step is actually opening this in After Effects. Now I'm going to be using After Effects Beta, but the process has been the same for quite a, quite a few years, so not much will change in this either. So here's my previously built one here. Hooray, there it is there. But I'm going to start this afresh for everyone. So I'm going to go to, um, let's actually go to File, New Project. I'm just going to, so I actually might just save this one. Uh, Parallax. All right, probably should have saved that before. So this is going to be pretty much what you're going to look at when you first open up Thanks, Smiley Faces, um, After Effects. And 
we're not going to be building a new composition because we've built our composition in roughly about the size that we want. Um, but if you do want to make it slightly smaller or anything like that, you can go to new composition or you can go to composition, new composition up here and go through and change and set your format. But the one that I have made is the correct format that I wanted. So, and it's got the correct files. So I'm going to go new composition from footage. And likewise, you can also go composition, new composition, and you can also go file, import, file, and find your document. So either way is going to, going to work. I'm going to go to documents, and I'm looking for that .psd that I just saved, Photoshop document. So at this point, regardless of whether you've hit composition from your footage or file import, um, this will give you the same outcome. So parallax, WF2. So I'm going to do it the other way just to show you. New composition from footage. Um, there it is, my documents, parallax, WW2. So pretty much the same thing. Here is very a very important step. We want to import this. So this is a Photoshop document we're importing. We do not want to bring in as footage. It is not a video. It is not footage. It is actually a composition. And the one I want to check is composition retain layer sizes. So this is going to bring in all my layers and it's going to keep them in the same size and the same place as they were in Photoshop. So I'm going to click on that and press open. It's going to give me the option of editable layer styles. Now I'm not actually using any layer styles at the moment, but at this point it's not going to add. So I'm going to hit OK. And over here in my project window is what we'll see here. We're going to see a little thing here, which is a composition. So anytime you see this little icon with a circle, triangle, square, that is a composition. And below that is a folder with each of the individual layers. And you know, if I double click on one of these, you'll see it will open up there. I'm going to close that off. So by the way, if you do double click on a layer, whether in the panel here or up here, it is going to give you a quick preview of this. Um, and note that that is not your composition. That's not what's going on. So with all that in mind, I'm going to go over to this colored one here and double click on that. And that is going to open up my composition. And if we have a look here, you'll actually see that we've got different layers. They are in order, array, and they are labeled, which is what we want as well, and all the rest of it. Now, I've just realized, and this may or may not be uh, a good or a bad thing, um, is that I haven't actually removed the sky from my background layer in Photoshop. So that's not the end of the world. I'm actually going to quickly switch back to Photoshop here, and I'm going to find my background layer. There it is there. I want to get rid of the sky in that. So there it is there. So what I might do for that is go to Select, sky again because I had that already and instead of pressing the mask button from there like that I'm going to inverse select so command shift I or you can go select inverse you can never find it when I need it there we go select inverse so it's going to now select the bottom area and hit that mask key hooray and now I've got the sky layer and that selected and here's the cool thing is if I press Command S on Photoshop, save it, and then go back to After Effects. Hopefully what we should be able to see now is that my background layer now has that sky removed. All right, so Photoshop actually talks to After Effects. If you update something, a layer in Photoshop, it will, once you save it, it will update in After Effects or Song. All right, so here they are, and they're all in order. Let's set this up for a parallax shot. All right, I've got them in order, great. And what we're gonna do, there's some little buttons at the bottom uh, left here, and this is gonna give you our options in our timeline. And so if you don't see something that I'm doing, do toggle these on and off. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn all of these layers into 3D. It's a little cube item here, which is basically gonna turn all of these layers into 3D. So that's awesome. And now we can actually move them in Z space. So forwards, backwards, up, down, left, right, you name it, we can do it. So now I'm gonna set up a camera. 
right, so I'm gonna go layer, new, camera. And there are a lot of different cameras and different ways you can set up the camera. I'm gonna leave this as default, most people typically do. To start with, you can change it at a later point. And I'm gonna hit OK. And that has now created camera one. If you need to rename something in After Effects, select the layer and press return or enter in case you need to change it. But there is my camera. Now, moving my camera, way to do that really easy is hit the C for camera key. And if you have a look up the top here on the toolbar, we've got a few little camera operation tools. We've got orbit, dolly pan, uh, rotate, but you can access those just by pressing the C key over and over again. C, 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 C. It's going to give us our main controls for that. So if I actually click on that and rotate my camera, you can see, well, it's, you know, it's doing something, but it still looks like a flat postcard. So what I actually need to do is put these things in depth and then scale them so that they'll still fit my document. Now to do this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the corner of my view panel here and go from one view to two views. Now this is not compulsory, but it does help. And what you can see is I can actually click between these two and do different things with them. So I'm going to go to this one and select this one on the right. And for the camera, I'm going to set this, have this set for, to default. Um, but you can basically choose the view that you want. So you can go top, back, left, and, and zoom out. You can kind of see what's happening there. That's the postcard and that's our camera. What I'm going to do is just go default for that one and then grab the C for camera tool. And I'm just going to move that just so we can kind of see what's going on in our screen. So that's there. And this screen on the left, I'm going to click in there and set that to camera one. So this is on the left is what camera one is actually going to see. This one here is just a default. So it's just a, a proxy camera, so to speak. All right, now it's time to start moving our layers. So the foreground layer, I'm actually going to leave in place. So that's, you know, these stones here. Um, the dude, he's going to be a little bit further in the front. So I'm going to grab my move tool, V, and I'm just going to move him forwards or rather backwards in space. Z depth. And you can see this, if you press the P key, we'll actually show you the position of our layer. So um, these first numbers is X and Y. Uh, sorry, uh, X, left and right, Y, which is up and down. And the final one is Z. So dragging that left to right is going to move that character forwards and backwards in Z depth. Now we can use our little um, gizmo here to move characters around but I'm going to move them in depth. If you need to move your camera a little bit you can just to kind of see what's going on and now I'm going to grab the background layer and I'm going to do the same. So move tool and I'm going to shift that back. I might do the sky as well. I don't need to see the original image so turn that off. Background and sky I'm going to move both of those at the same time. You can kind of see what we're doing there and I'm moving those back in space. And now I'm going to just grab the sky by itself and move that even further back, like so. So if we do have a look at this layer over here, we go to see the camera, you can see essentially we're going to have our layers all in different, different depth of field. The next thing is just getting our scaling right. So if we are going to move the camera, typically we may want the objects slightly bigger than they should be. But I'm going to select the sky layer to start with, and I'm going to press the letter S. Now, S is just a shortcut for scale. Um, you can also access this by going to the drop down and finding scale. But if you know the shortcut, it just saves a bit of space. And I'm going to click on that. And I'm just going to scale that up like so. Now, you may wish to move it around a little bit as required, but find something that's going to work for you. I'm going to grab the background, S for scale. Drag it up, find a good position for that. And then the dude, I'm actually okay with his scale. I do want to make sure I do hide the bottom of his legs because I haven't built those. So I do want to make sure that he's there um, in position. All right, let's animate this sucker. So hopefully these are in place. You may need to tweak things a little bit. So again, 
as we move our camera, if we go anything too extreme, those objects can disappear off. So I'm going to go back to my views, switch it back to one view. Let's zoom in a little bit, command plus, command minus, and set the camera to camera one. So it's that camera that we built here. All right, let's minimize these. This is what we're going to animate. So camera. First thing, I'm also going to look at my, my composition here. And I currently have it set for about 30 seconds, which is way too long for what I want. I'm going to get this down to maybe about five or six seconds. So go to the six second mark, around about there. Or you can type in here. So zero, zero is frames, six is seconds. So you can go in and you know, dot click in there, type in exactly how much, where you want your playhead. And then I'm going to grab the end, this little blue marker here, pretty small stuff. But I'm going to drag that down. Press the shift key and it's going to lock in to where my playhead is. And then in this gray area here, I'm going to right click and go to trim comp to work area, like so. And there we have it. So now to animate the camera. So the camera, I'm going to hit the letter P for position. And in After Effects, really easy to animate uh, something. What you need to do is press the stopwatch icon and that will create a keyframe. So I'm starting at the beginning. And I've got a keyframe there and I'm going to press C for camera and I'm going to just grab and see if I can find a starting movement for that. So maybe I'll just start over here like that. And as I can see, as you, as you can see probably, is that all of a sudden my layers don't actually fit all that well. So this is an opportunity for me to go back and just make some adjustments for that. So my background copy, cool, I'm just going to hit scale I'm going to scale it up a bit more and I might move that down oops sorry move tool move that down a bit let's go to my foreground copy I scale that a little bit like that and that way you just want to make sure that everything kind of fits in place you're not accidentally you know, having your image disappearing off the screen and so that's going to lock that position in there and now I'm going to move that to in this case, I'm just going to go just about halfway and see for camera and I might change the parallax of that a little bit. And once again, if it goes off the screen, you may need to adjust your image a little bit, but you scrub through. Oh yeah, it's kind of working. Nice. And now I'm going to do, take this to the end and I'm just going to push the camera through. So I'm going to go see for camera and in this case, I'm going to dolly in. See for camera again, see for a camera again, and maybe move the position a little bit. Let's see if you can find a good camera move without going too far off the screen. And I have gone off the screen there a little bit. So I don't want to change that. So I'm going to go back to this keyframe here. You can delete keyframes, but I'm just going to make it a little bit more fitted in there, and that should work fairly well. All right, so that's kind of it um, for that part. There's one other little trick I'm going to mention, which is um, if you are doing an extreme camera move, so let's say I'm going to go to this one and I'm going to get my camera and let's dolly it in, let's rotate it, and you, you get something extreme, you, will, you are going to see that kind of cut off edge to a shot. So essentially what's happening here is the, the cards, the cutout uh, objects, um, they're going to stay flat, but what we can do potentially for that is I'm going to select those layers there. I'm actually not going to select the sky layer. I'm going to go foreground dude and background copy, shift selecting them. I'm going to right click, go to transform, and go to auto orient. So I'm going to click on that, and I'm going to click on orient towards camera. So I'm going to hit OK for that, and basically what it's going to do is it's going to just make sure that no matter where my camera is placed, those objects are always going to face towards the camera, which works for most things. So I've obviously totally messed this shot up, but hopefully you can see what we're doing from there. So if I do need to fix this up, let's dolly back again, and let's rotate the position. So I'm just hitting the C key again. Until I get where I wanted my camera in the first place without too much fuss. Right, 
let's try that. A little bit off, but you know, we can you can see where we're going there. Now, additional things potentially to do this is add particle effects and all that kind of stuff, which is what I did in the previous one. I downloaded some explosions and some smoke effects and stuff like that. So I will put out a separate tutorial for adding auxiliary effects and stuff like that. But now the two other really important things for this is saving this correctly and also exporting. So if you are saving this stuff, I do recommend saving incrementally in case something tragic happens, but saving it and collecting the dependencies is one of the most important things you do need to know. So let's do that. If I simply go Command S or Control S or go File, Save or Save As, it will save this project. So I can call it WW2Photo, for example, uh, let's call it V3, whatever we're going to call it, find the locations. If you do save that, it will save it, but it will save it as a .aep. So there it is there, .aep, After Effects Project. Now, if you take that After Effects Project and put it on your hard drive or open it on a separate computer or move files around or anything like that, it will not open correctly. Essentially what you'll get is you'll get a test pattern where your um, documents, your Photoshop documents, your video files, your audio files, anything that's linked to this After Effects project, if, it, if After Effects cannot find it, it will not open correctly. And you'll just get test patterns and then you'll have to find the files again. So to avoid that, what we're gonna do is we're going to go to File, Dependencies, and Collect Files. So file dependencies, click files, click on that. And typically I'll just go, yep, let's let's do all. And I'm gonna go and hit collect. It's gonna ask me where I wanna save this to. Again, I've got mine in my documents. It's got the same title. And I'm gonna press save. It's gonna run through. And then in my documents folder, there is the folder. If I open that up, we have the After Effects project. We also have a report that tells me a bunch of things like what effects I have, where the source, what the source files are. And over here, I've got a footage file, which has, in this case, it's only got the Photoshop document. But if you have video files, audio files, this is where everything will be collected to. It keeps everything in one neat place. So when you do take this elsewhere, you need to take that entire folder with you. Um, so it needs to know where that footage is at all times. If you don't, uh, it's not necessarily the end of the world, though it is a little bit annoying. Um, instead of having a Photoshop icon here, for example, it will have a test pattern icon. You will need to right click on a layer that you're looking for and go to replace footage, file, and then you'll actually have to go and dig around and see if you can find that and hit open and hopefully it will relink the other ones if they're in the same place. But it can be an absolute nightmare. So please do remember file dependencies and collect files. So. If you add more files, then you can add it to it. But once you're ready to go, that should be good. All right, next one. Let's render the sucker out. So I'm going to go to render this out. This means basically exporting as a video. Um, I do recommend saving before rendering. Strange stuff can happen. But I'm going to go to File, Export, Add to Render Queue. Now, you do have an option for using Adobe Media Encoder. It's mostly the same thing, except it doesn't rely on After Effects. So you can keep using After Effects for your project. But I will typically use After Effects for this. So add to render queue and down the bottom here is our render queue. So there's our, our project, there's our render queue. And the more of these you build, the more render queues you'll see stacking up. I'm just going to bring this out a little bit. And essentially to set up our render, we've got these little blue glowing things that we just need to address before we press the render button here. So first of all, render settings. Let's have a look. It currently says best settings. And typically for this, that's what we'd go for. You've got some draft options if you're trying to get a low render, particularly for really heavy projects. Um, you can change the frame rate if you want, although weird stuff can happen if you are vastly changing that. So typically we can leave that if we want just a good quality render. Next one, output module. All right, well, this is what it's going to export it out. So let's click on that. Mine's currently set to H.264, which is a really good format for this. Um, and we do have some further options in here under format options that we can go through. H.264 is pretty good. Um, 
audio is going to be on by default now, but you can turn it off. You can change a few settings in here. Um, there's a few other options I'm going to mention that are worth looking at. So another one worth looking at is QuickTime. And if you go into Format Options and down to where it says Animation, um, there's some actually really good ones in here in Apple ProRes. So Apple ProRes um, 422 is really, really good. And also 444 is really good. And I think from memory, um, 422 HQ. Um, now, I'm, now I'm struggling to remember which one. Um, one of these has the ability to also have um, alpha channels as well. But 422 is good quality. Uh, if you go 422 proxy, it's a little bit lighter as far as the file size as well. So I'm going to go Apple Pro's 422 proxy, but do check with your requirements of what your client or yourself needs as an output. And I'm going to hit OK. So um, okay, so this is where we'll actually get the option if we have um, RGB and alpha. So if we have a transparency on there, um, we should, it should be 444. And then we have the option of RGB and alpha. Alpha is essentially just a transparent layer. So good for doing VFX. Anyway, let's get back. Uh, 422 proxy. So it's going to be pretty good quality, nice and light. Uh, audio I don't need, but there's no audio in that anyway. So I'm going to hit OK. So that's set, output set as that. And then finally, output to where am I going to save it to? Uh, I'm going to put mine in documents again. You can rename it. I'm going to call that it's a movie file. Hit save. And then you need to hit the render key. So render key is just going to churn through it. And this can take a while if it's really heavy or, you know, if you're lucky if it's um, you know, lightweight. Um, we can do that. If you are finding your project is super heavy, do talk to your lecturer. Hopefully they've got a solution for that. And you should hear a little ding sound once that's done. I've got the headphones on, so I probably couldn't hear it. And there's mine here, Parallax, a VW2 version one, MOV file, it's 138 megabytes. And I'm just gonna open that up for you. VLC, yes. And there's my little Parallax video. Obviously not the best thing out there, but hopefully it does show you some of the basics. All right, so I hope that helps you out a little bit. Um, if there are any issues, please do check out the other documentation. Um, there's plenty of other videos out on this, but this goes through the entire steps from Photoshop all the way through After Effects and hits a few extra markets and some of the others. Work. So good luck to you. Ciao.